Um, and Dr. Dylan Grigg completed his doctoral thesis on a comparative study of old and young Shiraz vines in the Barossa. He is a consultant viticulturalist um, through his company Meristem. Hello, Dylan, I'm just bigging you up. Um, and as, as well as making his own wonderful wine um, from Old Vine Grenache. I haven't had this this morning, by the way. I have oh, fantastic. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to finishing off the bottle later. Obviously not all by myself. Um, and uh, Dylan's um, thesis is available. You can actually link to it from our oldvines.org website. But Dylan and I, I was fortunate to be able to meet with him um, in uh, St. Albans recently when he was over from the UK. And we asked Dylan to come on board so that he could talk more about his perspective as a viticulturalist and also as a researcher on why vines grow old, lessons from the past for the future, um, for the present and the future. <laughs> so um, I'm going to hand over to Dylan and um, please do put your questions into the Q&A. We would like to make time to pose those questions to him. So thank you, Dylan, for joining us. We really appreciate your time and I hope it's not too late there for you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Where else would I be on a Friday evening at 10.30 p.m.? <laughs> Talking old <laughs> vines. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, let me just uh, share my screen, which is going to be this one. Share and present. How is that? Are we good? Yeah, all good. Great. Well, thank you for the uh, introduction, Sarah. It was great to meet you, and it was great to be part of the um, the first Old Vine Conference and also to be invited back on the 5th, even if I did get the uh, second to last graveyard slot. Um, I really like the title of this, Learning from the Past, Building for the Future. So my previous presentation was um, pretty nerdy and went through my PhD thesis. This one's going to be a little more, a little more practical and, and rounded. Um, so as introduced, I have been an independent viticulture consultant since 2008 under Mary Stem Viticulture and um, more recently when moving back from living in Spain back to Australia, I purchased a, a small vineyard, which has um, four hectares of very old Grenache. And I now use that as a tool to talk about my passion for viticulture and also um, make some a small quantity of wine, which can help me share the um, my passion for viticulture and also old vines. So, um, this talk is going to be based on observations that I've made over years of research, consulting the many hours I've spent in my own vineyard and also other vineyards around the world. So looking back to look forward, I, I had the idea after my father, I think you guys can see the cursor. Oh, you're not, you're on mute. I'll assume you can. We can see it, Dan. Um, awesome. We can see the cursor. Yeah. Great. Uh, my father was going through some photos from, um, a relative who was a photographer in the 1920s and had this image, which reminded me, I and mean, it's in, taken in the Brossa Valley at Lights Pass, which reminded me of our own vineyard, the 1990s plantings. And it made me, it, it made me think um, about when these vines were planted, what was actually the thought process or the vision for the people that were planting those vineyards? So my context today is largely going to be um, on New World, but it's also going to cover Old World with many, um, many examples from my own experience and environment, um, because in Australia, we're really lucky to have um, a wealth of old vine material, like more than 200 hectares and vines ranging from one year old to over 180 years old. So 
uh, site adaption and some of those scientific things regarding old vines. I'm going to leave that alone today. I'm going to talk more about things we can all see when we open a book or we sit on the old vine conference or we're scrolling through the gram or visiting vineyards and reading articles. I want to encourage everyone to think about how our oldest vines came to be so old. And when I talk old vines, my frame of reference is obviously in, in South Australia or in Australia where our vines can be proper old and well over 150 years. So definitely past that 30 year slump. So we're always talking about old vines in the now and who has them and who doesn't and where do they begin and which parcel did you find? But some places around the world, I'm sure there's, and I've seen vineyards that look similar to the day they were planted here, yeah, 80, you know, 70, 80, 90 years later. But there's also a lot of places around the world, a lot of vineyards, um, where the vineyards look very, very different to what was perhaps the vision or when they were planted, which this kind of makes me think that modern planting procedures and best practice, um, where that's leading us. And just because we can drag a deep ripper one and a half metres underground with hundreds of horsepower, does this make for the best site or a suitable site? Are we using this technology and power that we have to make suitable sites that will persist in a longer term context? And to know if this is still going to be an ideal site after many, many growing cycles. I like to think about when the 180 year old vineyard was one years old, what was the management like? I think finding this book, which is an almanac um, from 1855 and describes how to plant vineyards in South Australia and how to plant fruit trees and all sorts of things, um, that this is a very simple book. There's only two or three pages and it doesn't have all of the technology but we need to use the technology to our advantage, but also look back and think about some of the simplicity or tradition, which has obviously been a proven formula because vineyards that were planted in 1855 are still around today. So what do you need to have a, what do you need in the first place to have a vineyard that's gonna persist is you need a site, that's pretty important. Um, one thing I'm often struck with as I'm traveling through Europe and especially during my time living in Catalonia um, is the number of terraces and terraced hillsides that you see around that are abandoned. Um, previously supported vines, unlikely to support vines now or in the future because of biological or maybe economical reasons. But I'm sure there's always exceptions like those beautiful terraces we just saw in, in Etna. But there are a great many vacant terraces compared to the ones still performing. And that is an indication of site selection for longevity. Not all sites are equal, just like the characteristics of old vine vineyards. So lessons that we can take from old vineyards and vineyards that we're establishing now is that we see a lot of increasing complexity in design, expense and management. I mean, an old vineyard in uh, Rioja Alta is very simple bushfires. Or well, here we are in, um, this one's in Tasmania, but it's a VSP trellis with multiple catch wires or a um, very complicated lyre trellis. Obviously, these are all um, perhaps designed to take advantage of the site. This double divided trellis would be um, due to the high capacity, but it's an example of modern management tools which aim to overcome potential shortcomings in sites when ideal land is not always available. So these old sites perhaps didn't have deep ripping. I'm sure they didn't have the horsepower we have with bulldozers. Um, they didn't have irrigation. They didn't have complex trellising wires and posts and materials that need to be changed and updated and maintained over time. We current, currently, we uh, compensate for lots of variables to try and equalise the sites, but not all sites will be equal. Perhaps we should consider also that some of these very old sites, which was also mentioned just by one of our previous speakers, were perhaps not always valued for their high quality or not planted with high quality in mind, but it was they were planted for yield or for production. But it turned out they had the right balance, variety and vigour and yield. And over time, 
those management selections that were made in the past um, had minimal limitations or obstacles so the vineyard could persist into the future. So you would probably refer to that as a, a strong site and a strong site will naturally provide consistency of growth and vigour. Um, a strong site will be the last one that's uprooted in hard economic times and it might be classed as being quality and that quality might be in the kilograms that come off of it or in the quality of fruit for the end product if we are talking wines but overall i like to think of this as a, a strong site and a site that was well selected and established in the past it has some a sort of momentum or inertia and that's what we're feeling now with the old vine movement and finding and and um celebrating these old vineyards is they're there for a reason so the more supports and props and technology that is um, imported into a vineyard earlier in its life probably decreases the overall lifespan of the vineyard to a certain extent. Because if there's scaffolding that's required to hold things up from an early age, then we can maybe might run into trouble if there are periods of low management inputs or tough times. These old vine sites perhaps were planted on deeper soils. Um, in the Australian experience, I know from my PhD, the five sites, the very old sites that I had, they were all within one straight football kick to a, a local stream or a creek so that water could perhaps be ferried early on when they were planted because whilst there was no, there certainly wasn't drip irrigation or um, pressure pumps, but they could have sustained some of these vines with buckets. Or, or other means. Um, but if the vines are planted close to close to rivers or on deeper soils, then they potentially have more capacity. And this capacity adds to that momentum or inertia that I just spoke about. Um, and with the capacity can come size and the increase in size of the vine. Older vines that have been planted on high capacity soils, such Sand over clay isn't necessarily high capacity, but um, it's certainly got a lot more um, or a lot less restriction for growth than, say, a hillside slope that is full of rock. Well, here is another a site from a good friend of mine, Yako, in, um, in South Africa, showing large trunks and quite large trunk structure. So old vines, quite possibly when they were first planted, had very high vigour and were productive and were in sites and with... Um, trellising and uh, structural techniques that were easy to manage without technology. Some attributes that we perhaps wouldn't class as ideal characteristics now, but because of the, the time that they've been in the ground, they've come into focus and can produce high quality fruit when perhaps that wasn't the initial goal when they were planted some 100 or 200 years ago. Drivers of site selection in the past were probably productivity and consistency with minimal inputs, um, which we were all talking about how it's difficult to find labour and the cost of inputs are going up. And I um, I was on presenter view, so I couldn't see all of Rose's, Rose's talk, but I'm sure there's some of that in the sustainability speak. And in terms of sustainability, when old vines were planted, I think it was, it was actually mentioned in Trentino that they... Um, the double pergola was planted five metres or quite wide. Um, old vineyards are often planted on wide spacings, perhaps at lower densities, perhaps for ease of management, but I know in arid climates, it's for access to water. So this gives the vines space because they're further apart. So when we look at a, an old vineyard or any, or any vineyard, we're always trying to manage the canopy and manage the area, but specifically looking at old vineyards, what do we, what do we see? I see the space that they occupy. The space is too often overlooked as a variable because it's, it's valuable. So we want to try and fill all the space that we can. We want to plant the vines so close together that they fill the cordon or per hectare, we've got X number of buds, which means we'll have X number of kilograms. I don't think these calculations um, 200 years ago were really at the at, in the forefront of thinking when people were planting. 
because wide planting densities will yield less early on and make less money potentially. And these older, these older vineyards were, that were planted on wide spacings, like those pergolas in Trentino, the drivers for this might have been machinery or water or practical implications like wanting to cultivate up and down and across or plant in a diamond and cultivate three ways. And inadvertently, this has allowed the vines in these vineyards that we now celebrate to grow and expand and take up a lot of that space. Where water is a limiting factor, they don't take up as much of the space. But where there is a higher capacity, vines can grow very large and very big. So the challenge for vineyards is that planting on the spacing or density that will allow 100 years of growth and generation of tissue may be un uneconomical early and for a longer time than planting closer. So it's a bit of a driver against doing it. And some of the space that vines occupy would be the horizontal space. I mean, these, I don't know how many of you have been to see the old braided cordon vines in Tenerife. They occupy a huge amount of space. And just think about the economics of planting. I mean, we're on an island, so the economics are always a little bit skewed, but these vines in the background here, these are young vines that are planted and being trained in this traditional braided cordon method. There's a lot of vacant space per hectare that won't be producing grapes there. Jonathan um, told me that this was so that they would be able to separate the vines and utilise the soil for growing potatoes and other crops, just like they did um, in Trentino under the pergolas. So it was a double utilised utilisation of space, whereas nowadays we have more of a, a monoculture. And these things are 200 years old and they're so huge you couldn't move them. And on a side note, they've survived so long probably down to the pruning method, which only prunes back to um, back to young wood without making deep cuts and keeping a lot of stored carbohydrates. So there's horizontal space, there's vertical space. You look at a vineyard, um, if you've got trellising, vertical space is kind of constrained inside a box, which tempts people to cut back and, and make large wounds, which anyone that's read into or taken an interest in um, modern pruning te techniques know that any large wound can be a real um, can be a real negative for the longevity of the vine. So there's romantic views about the shapes of the vines, but the practical view is that this plant has been restricted and not been allowed to grow as high or as tall as it would have wanted to naturally. I mean, every year we cut off ninety percent of the season's growth of the plant to keep it down in a region that we can we can manage. This is usually um, controlled growth with the seasonal pruning and the intention is seasonal, but the results can last decades and centuries. Now, if you haven't noticed a little thread through all of my pictures and all of the oldest vineyards that I know of, especially in arid climates, is they're all pruned to short pruning. So that's a hint to pruning and also to structure and longevity. So the gradual expansion of that permanent wood into space over time as a new layer is added on every season is what gives this creeper of a vine some structure. Because remember, vines have tendrils, they have no pith, they have no heartwood to stand up on their own, so they must be cut close and consistently in a spur pruned method um, so that they can have their own structure. And even when they get old, they need some, sometimes need some external support. I mean, if we look at the management here, the bud number per hectare probably hasn't changed for decades because the vine has a preset number of arms and it's pruned back to two buds on each of those arms. So the bud number per hectare hasn't changed, but the location and space of that bud relative to the vine and its shading has changed, which could have quality implications, which is difficult to replicate with younger vines. Um, it's one of those, I could, I won't go on a tangent into my thesis too deeply, but the findings on size and the implication that the permanent wood and that stored carbohydrate in the vines plays a large part in quality traits and adaption and ironing out seasonal variability and that um, early spring growth. Um, 
it's one of the major differences between old and young vines is the year that they're planted and the size that they are, and they're limited with time. So we've talked about horizontal space, vertical space, the combination. So if there's space to grow and vines can be cared for and managed consistently on top of all of the other biological and economic and other, other hurdles and um, factors that can influence growth, uh, growth, then vines can grow into potentially some pretty big structures. So I mentioned briefly before, we need to remember this is a liana, this is a climbing plant. As Nayan uh, Indiana Jones presented um, earlier, vines climbing in trees is their natural habitat. So pruning, which we do to keep them in our habitat, is challenging their form to fit in with our management. So we're still learning about structuring and shaping vines with care and attention. And that very old um, manual from 1855 had some interesting statements about pruning, which are now very popular and but were forgotten for quite some time. So with age brings wood volume. Pruning should allow this to support age. And this vine has a lending hand. This one's in California. This vine is holding itself up with this, uh, it's almost a singular pruning method and def definitely is in the new world and for Australia. These Grenache vines, which are thought to be the oldest Grenache vines in the world, are prone to be self-supporting. Or over in South Africa or in Spain, wide spacing, low, unirrigated and old vines. Vineyards that started low, respected the wood and the vines found space and structure because they weren't put too close together to become unmanaged or unmanageable. So to, to reinforce some of the lessons from old vines, I thought I'd show you this picture. This is a beautiful vine. I drive past it often and it really highlights to me that age requires space. People look at it and think, wow, that's a great vine. And I look at that thing and I think, wow, someone didn't want to make a big cut and they worked with the vine and with time and now we've got these beautiful old vines. And how did they do it? So this vineyard is the same vineyard but a different vine. This is the trunk. This is the uh, original cordon, probably a spur down here, because older vineyards were often planted close to the ground with rudimentary posts, if posts at all. And as the vine has grown up and out, instead of taking a chainsaw to it, because its neighbour was so close or the trellis post was already very short, the trellis, whoop, wrong direction, the trellis was raised here some time later. And then again, it was raised a third time and a fourth time with an extension on the post that was probably put in in the in the 90s. So this is an example where um, age requires space and the pruning system has allowed that. And the drivers for reworking a vineyard here have been avoided by thinking ahead. Uh, this is an iconic vineyard and probably one of the most famous old vine vineyards in Australia, the uh, Henschke Hill of Grace vineyard. And here, Prue has done an amazing job with vines that were planted in 1860 that are now on a VSP trellis. It's an adaption to the vine within the site so that the vine can fit and not cut the vine to fit the site. So here, the, uh, the canopy was sprawling over and the vines weren't supporting themselves. So they've got catch wires to hold the canopy up and, and improve light and maintain quality and production. Because I see this so many times in, in vineyards of all ages, if the vines, if the vines are encroaching on space or someone wants to make a big, a big management move and cut them back, this vineyard was, is around 100 years old, and this was the original cordon height you can see here. The right arm was cut, the left arm was cut, and a new sucker was trained. But as we know, with the hydraulic sectoring of um, the sap as it comes up the trunk, the left is on the left, the right is on the right, when you cut through that, it doesn't always bridge straight across. So this vine, yes, it's been reworked, but it's lost a lot of its old vine root system. So there's always implications that need to be considered. 
this is the vine I took only last week, I think, at um, at my vineyard where you can see the old trunk is split apart and was hanging down. And there's two rows that I think in the 90s, because they had the same post when this was planted, was put up, were put on a cordon wire and it was raised up, bang, with a water chute, put on a wire, and now it's gone too high, too quick. I keep it as an example, and it's a great um, it's a great tool to learn and and show these two rows compared to the other old vines that are still as a bush. We see it a lot for improving mechanisation or perhaps getting away from frost. Here, the original branching point for this vine was so low, and now the trellis is really high. It's wrapped on the wire, and to create a rejuvenation point down here is going to take some time. I've been working for several years, a number of years, to try and get these rejuvenation points close to the trunk. So we need to remember that vines want to vine. We've got to work with the physiology and the site to have balanced vines and allow the vines to grow old if they can. How are we for time? I think we've got two minutes. Let's go with this. Speaking of vines wanting to vine, cross over back to the thesis. If, layering of vines the climbing is natural the vines want to go up in trees they evolve that way but also layering and adventitious rooting so rejuvenation via layering be it intentional here where the shoot was laid down and brought up or unintentional advent or truly adventitious where a vine here has let down and where it's touched the soil it's it's had the conditions so it can reroot and now it has juvenile roots attached to um, mature roots. And this is a form of uh, enhancing the longevity of vineyards. Although you can't do it everywhere, um, in areas without phylloxera, of course, it's possible. Areas with phylloxera, you need to be careful. This is an image taken in Spain, in Penedes. Um, and the phylloxera, if there is phylloxerated soil, the young vine or the daughter can draw too much from the mother and can actually reduce the vigour. And in some places, they were telling me in Malta that the daughter will kill the mother by taking too much nutrition away. We can make some of these, we can make some of these interventions in the medium term, such as here with reworking. But the vision we need to accept is that we're not growing this vineyard to be 200 years old. We're working with a, with a shorter window um, with the vines and with shorter goals. But some cuts we should always try and avoid. Um, I think I'll start to wrap up and say the epigenetic adaptions aside, We've all, and all of these other things we've talked about that we can all see, when we open a book and scroll the gram and visit vineyards and read these articles now, I want to encourage everyone to think about how our oldest vines came to be so old. What does the trellis look like? Where were they planted? What's around them? And what were the conditions and the driving forces when they were planted? Because we're choosing low yielding clones now for immediate quality, but if we chose high yielding clones here for fruit volume and we're 130 years later getting good quality with perhaps reduced volume. If we've got a low yielding clone at 130 years of vine growth onto that, I don't know where we'll be. I feel like we're on a journey with old vines. We're on a train track of viticulture and all of these vines that were planted pre phylloxera um, are on a different track to us and we need to keep looking left and right. So, I don't want to run too much over time, so I'm going to leave it there and leave a few minutes for questions, if that's cool. Fantastic. Thank you, Dylan. Um, absolutely brilliant presentation and obviously huge expertise and insight, but also you're such a great communicator. So thank you. I found that enormously um, enormously insightful and inspiring and I love the way you talk about the different tracks and that we just need to oh hang on a minute sort of look look left because as you say we're on a different track so a um, couple of questions so Robert Piet says Dylan says that age requires space however this is not what I see in many Beaujolais vineyards of 80 to 100 years with 10,000 vines per hectare, is this an exception? Yes, and as I stated, and I didn't have enough slide space to put up, there's also vineyards in Spain that would be 100 years old, and the pruning techniques have probably been consistent. 
And the capacity of the site has also been in balance for the variety. So, yeah, you might be 80, 100 years old, but your go goblet pruning or your short pruning hasn't allowed the vines to expand outside of what is their allotted space. So you've got that good choice of site, which has allowed you to have the space to have a structure to have long-lived vines. So you're spot on. It is possible. Great. Um, a question from Etienne Niesling, who I know is um, a South African currently working in on um, intravarietal diversity in France. His question is, question to Dylan and the example in Australia, how is climate change challenging the amount of sites actually favourable for vines to grow old? Oh, it's a good question. It's a big question. Um, I think that it's the same as it's the same as everywhere. Um, sites that have been selected, you can drive in many regions now and drive past vineyards that have been abandoned or let go because perhaps it was a good idea at the time and the climate shifted a tiny bit and they don't have the the resources or the technology to support the growth. So I think that the growing regions may shrink, but regions, there are also regions with long histories like my vineyard or the, the Barossa Valley, which is has some deep has some deep soils and has capacity in clays to hold water. And modern management techniques can still keep vineyard areas in production. But absolutely it's something that we give a lot of consideration to when replanting or expanding any vineyards is the suitability because the number of suitable sites may be shrinking or they may actually be shifting, which an example in, in Australia would be the popularity of planting in um, Tasmania, which is a much more southern latitude. Thank you. And a, a comment rather than a question, but from Prue Henschke, who's... True. I think I hope your ears have been um, burning. I hope I got a, it right. In a good way. <laughs> um, so Prue says, um, "Bitis has an unusual feature that, as a vine, it can form bark layers and an expanding central wood structure, so it can form a solid structure. So we're dealing with a unique plant genus. We need to get Prue onto a future conference as soon <laughs> as soon as possible, but." Could what you comment on that and just sort of dig into that, explain how that helps? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the, it can self-support um, given compared to some lianas that won't have that ability. So layer, layering on the, the tissue each year, I'm doing this when you can't even see it, each year as the vine expands, but... The, the bulk of the conductive tissue, when there's been dye experiments done, putting dye in the soil or injecting into trunks, most of the conductive tissue is around the outside. So the internal core um, isn't, um, isn't as functional, but we know that it is functional. It is functional to a certain point, and it is definitely a place where we can harbor wood disease. So good pruning and good management to maintain a solid trunk is definitely beneficial and possible to maintain maintain some structure in vines. Thank you. Dylan, thank you so much. I know we could all listen My to pleasure. you. Alice. Thank you for also for preparing such a detailed and, um, and compelling presentation. Um, as I say, Dylan also is making beautiful wine <laughs> and um, I um, do look out for it. And thank you for, for being with us today and, and have a lovely evening. Um, oh, I have a quick um, a Q&A. Um, oh, it's basically sharing some love, but let me read it to you. From Vitor Rocha de Souza. Thank you very much, Dr. Dylan Grigg, for your presentation. As an agronomist, I'm very passionate about different types of pruning on different types of plants, and I loved your presentation. Yeah, I mean, kind of make pruning sexy again. <laughs> like, well, making looking at the structure, let's just have a look at what, what we've got and learn from our mistakes so that we can not make them again, hopefully. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dylan. And Excellent. Really Thank you. Your support. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.